clinical Harry Kane cuts Chelsea's gap at the top of the league to seven points and puts Spurs four points clear of Liverpool, six points clear of fifth place Arsenal. And with a final FA Cup fixture to come at White Hart Lane next week, this is your East Spurs podcast. Hi guys, welcome back for another hour of talking all things Tottenham Hotspur. Please don't forget you can subscribe to the show as always via iTunes or Raycast and get every new brand new episode direct as it's released. You can of course follow us across all the usual social media platforms. You can catch us on Twitter and Instagram at E underscore Spurs. We're on Facebook, facebook.com dash E Spurs page. We're also on YouTube, Pinterest and Tumblr. And for all the links to all E Spurs platforms, you can head to our brand new website, which is www.e-spurs.com. On the Spurs podcast tonight, we'll be talking about the win over Everton as we eventually got over the line in a 3-2 win. We'll be taking your questions as always for the panel and finally we'll be previewing a final FA Cup fixture to come at White Hart Lane against Millwall next Sunday. What a show we've got in store. Before we talk all things Spurs tonight, let's introduce tonight's panel, talking us through the next hour of all things Spurs. I'm pleased to announce we've got our first ever female on the show. We've got Emma Story with us. Emma, how are you? Very well, thank you. How are you? Yes, very well. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I'm (laughs) honoured. Honoured to be the first girl. (laughs) Brilliant, brilliant. And I'm pleased to say we've got Ian back on the show with us. Ian, how are you? Very well, Rick. Nice to be back recording with uh, with all you guys. And nice to have you back. And we've got Jace back on the show as always. Jace, how are you? Absolutely fine, mate. Good win today, and with Woolwich losing yesterday, it's been a good weekend. It has been a good weekend indeed. And finally, to round off tonight's guests, we've got James back with us. James, how are you? I'm great, mate. Thank you very much for having me back on. Our pleasure as always. What a big win to review this afternoon. A win over Everton. Let's start with you, Emma. Firstly, just for our, any listeners out there that haven't heard of you before or known about you, do you want to give us a bit of background as to what you do? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Um, I am a sports journalist. Um, I work in TV and uh, digital, um, work mainly for Sky for the last 10 years or so. Uh, I am a season ticket holder on the shelf. I've been going to Spurs for about 20 three years now I'm just trying to work it out yeah 23 years um, and uh, in my job I'm lucky enough to spend quite a lot of time writing about us um, but I do unfortunately also have to write about the likes of Arsenal and Chelsea from time to time please don't judge me <laughs> <laughs> it's fair to say obviously in your experience with Spurs you've seen a kind of steady progress in recent years in, in the likes of Harry Kane what we've seen today have you seen a striker's rapid rise such as him at the moment I mean he's been incredible hasn't he this season bearing in mind he was two months out of the start. He's given them a two-month head start and he still ends up at the moment top scorer in the Premier League. What do you make of him? Oh, my God. I mean, there, there aren't enough kind of happy words to describe for me how phenomenal um, I think Harry Kane is and how much potential I think he's got. Um, you know, the, it, you kind of hit the nail on the head there when you said we've had two months where he didn't even play because he was injured and he's literally come back and it's, if he was, it's as if he was never away. Um, what I absolutely adore about him, um, as much as his talent, is his attitude and his work ethic, which is just, you know, it's so rare to see... Um, I hate to say modern footballers, but a lot of of current footballers, it's rare to see the kind of motivation and and work rate that that he and a lot of our um, our players at Spurs put in. I mean, I think the interesting thing with Harry is that um, he's so young still, and I think people forget it. Uh, You know, you get him, people kind of say, oh, you know, we'd rather have Diego Costa in our team, we'd rather have Alexis Sanchez in our team, we'd rather have Sergio Aguero in our team. Well, it's like, well, these guys are all older and more experienced, and yet Harry has the beating of them all. You know, there's no limit to how far um, I think he can go. And I think today, um, the first goal, I'm sure, you know, we're all going to talk about it and rave about it in detail. But, you know, I was there at White Hot Lane, and when he scored that goal, um, it was such a shock because it just came out of absolutely nothing. And I think it was the moment where I really felt like this is magic. What I'm watching is magic now. It reminded me of how I felt when I used to watch Gareth Bale play, um, that kind of, that real sort of, this guy can do anything, this guy can turn anything, this guy can change a game for us. Um, and obviously the fact that he's one of our own just makes it all so much more special and so much more emotional. And I have such a strong attachment to him. I'm so proud of everything he does. And I just think he can only get better. That's the most exciting thing about it. Um, he's 23 years of age. 
this is going to be the third season that he scores 20 goals in a row, um, 20 goals in the Premier League. I mean, we've never had a striker in our Premier League history that has consistently performed to that level. Yeah. No one, you know, he is breaking new ground for us. Yeah, he is truly phenomenal. I'm bringing you in, Jace. 19 goals so far this season. He has got that ability just to perform something out of nothing. Many strikers will look at that and just think, you know, this guy kind of leading the way in the Premier League. And you could arguably say on, on the basis of that game today, going into the break, he was the difference. And I think we are unlucky as well when Yama hitting the post, having a couple of penalties maybe denied. What did you make of the performance today? Well, first of all, I thought it was a, a really strange one from Everton because... You know, to me, it was a really big game for Everton. A win for them today would have put them right in the mix, particularly with Man United and Arsenal dropping points yesterday. And he thought, you know, even if we'd have ended up only, say, drawing the game, we'd have still ended up in the, the top three at the end of the day. So in many ways, it was, it was an even bigger one for Everton. And I thought we'd see a really good Everton come at us. But we, we were as comfortable, really, today for most of that game as we were in the, the games against West Brom and Stoke. We, we totally controlled it and bossed it. And other Wanyama and, and Musa Dembele, those two just just took control of the game by the scruff of the neck and, and rarely let Everton in. But Kane reminds me a lot of his finishing, I was saying today, reminds me a lot of, of how Defoe, you can see his work with Defoe as a, as a youngster and that he just sets himself and hits it so early, doesn't he? And he hits, hits shots from outside the box all over the place. He goes for the corners and he hits it with real venom at times. And that's very much the, the way that Jermaine Defoe scored so many goals for us. But another excellent performance. Three, three nice points. I thought three, two flattered Everton, really. It was a game that we, we just, you know, looked so comfortable in for, for, for most of it. Yeah. Should we be worried, Jace, about those couple of goals we can see at the end? Is that a bit of worry? Because we've looked so good recently at the back and to be kind of, I don't know, cut open like that at cut the time, is that, is that a worry for us, do you think? Yeah, it was another worry to concede from yet another set piece. Um, funnily enough, probably if we weren't 3-1 up, I think we'd have been just a little bit more switched on and they probably wouldn't have scored that one. But we'd, we've certainly got to defend set pieces better, that's for sure, because you know our, our defensive record from open play has been excellent, but there's too many set pieces and I suppose that's been the the one disappointment of the season of, of the goals we conceded but but actually when you looked back at it you know when you're watching the game you're obviously always nervous once Lukaku makes it 2-1 but between the 2-1 and us going 3-1 it wasn't as if they looked like they were going to get a, an equaliser did it it feels like it at the time when you're watching it but when you look back Hugo never really made a save after Lukaku's goal it's not like they hit a post it's not like we needed a, a massive tackle to keep us you know, to keep the score at 2-1. And I, I thought we were just staying in control even then. We didn't panic. That was a good thing today. We didn't start just clearing it any old hour and, and getting ourselves, you know, pushed push backwards. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that, actually. I never felt, you know, when when it, when Lukaku made it 2-1, I didn't feel for a second that we weren't going to hold on for that win. I didn't feel like we were in danger of throwing it away. And um, I don't really think, to be honest, there's too much to be concerned about with those two goals we conceded. That first goal... Toggen fell on his arse. Like, quite frankly, if he'd managed to stay on his feet, that goal would not have been going in. And yeah, I think I totally agree that the second goal, I think we just scored, we switched off for that. I mean, it literally was one minute between the two goals. I just think that had that been, had we not scored, had that, you know, situation not arisen almost straight from the kickoff, I don't think that would have been a goal. Let's bring you in, Ian, actually. Ian, you was at the game. What did you make of it? The performance overall, I just thought we were imperious from start to finish. And, you know, for, for me, you know, like Jason was saying, I was quite worried about the game. But that's off to Pochettino and the boys because we were set up right. Um, and I think we bossed it from start to finish. And um, the two goals, they went in when we perhaps lost a little bit of, of focus. But outside of that, it was a probably a, a better performance than the West Brom and the Stoke games because of the quality of the opposition because Everton are no mugs they you know they pressed us high up the pitch uh, but I think that for me what was telling is I think we won the battle of the fullbacks I think that Ben Davis and Carl Walker pushed Coleman and, and Baines back and, and that enabled us to get to play higher up the pitch so all in all I thought it was a fantastic performance from us all in all a great day at the football yeah, phenomenal. I mean, like I say, a new new Premier League club record, nine successive wins, bringing you in, James, just six games left at White Hart Lane. I mean, our form there this season has been nothing short of, like I say, we've made it a fortress. What do you put that down to? Is it the players just buying into the collective spirit at the moment with the fans? Yeah, I think playing at home, you're always going to have that, that advantage of, of having the boost of the fans, but... 
you know, there were times today where I thought the lane was quite flat, but but then there's times where it's absolutely rocking when teams who come here come come to the lane, they must be terrified of what they're coming up against because because we've got thirty six and a half thousand fans, the majority of them screaming our way and just the the atmosphere that we managed to drum up inside the stadium like White Hart Lane and it and I really hope that we can we can recreate things like that in the in the new stadium because it would be a shame to lose that amazing atmosphere that we've got and and it clearly clearly has an effect on on visiting teams because as you say nine games and uh, nine games win in, in the row uh, at the lane and so you know yeah I hope I hope we can recreate that buzz at the new stadium because it clearly clearly gets us points and and gives us results yeah and what did you make of the performance overall James for you decent job done. Definitely. Um, you boys have all said what I was thinking. In that Everton, they're not a bad team. They, you know, I, I looked at their lineup and and I thought, well, Tom Davis is is capable of, of pulling things out of the bag, just like our, our young players are. So is Romelu Lukaku and players like that, Ross Barkley and the like. But we made them look very average today. The the two goals we conceded, you guys touched on it that that they were both you know errors by Spurs. They definitely could have been cut out. Vertonghen got a bit unlucky, and then in the last minute, I think. You can't blame the lads for, for switching off a little bit with 3-1 up, uh, nothing set piece on just inside the half. Yeah. And so th- I'd say, yeah, definitely, there's, n- there's nothing to be worried about with those two goals. I, I saw it described as, as a 4-0 performance with a 3-2 scoreline, which, which I'll totally agree with. Bringing it back to you, Emma, I want to ask you about this. Um, we talked about it last week on the podcast. Ben Davis heavily criticised yes. recently, trying to prove himself at Spurs in the absence of Danny Rose. Today, he won more tackles, created more chances and completed more attacking third passes than any other Spurs player. What do you make of this guy? I am so glad that you've brought him up um, because I thought he was absolutely excellent today. And, um, you know, we were chatting in the in the crowd about it, saying that he's had a really rough ride and... When he first came back in to the team, when Danny got injured, he did look ropey. He did look poor. He did look off the pace. You know, his performance against Liverpool was an absolute disaster. I mean, all of them were, but him especially, unfortunately. Um, but I really feel the last couple of games that he's started to grow back into that role. And um, I think he's found his confidence again. Um, I always thought he was a decent player. Um, I always thought he was more than adequate cover for Danny. And I think, unfortunately, what you see with Ben is that um, it's what happens when you don't get loads of game time is that you do drop a little bit off the pace. It doesn't matter how much you do in training. uh, It doesn't necessarily translate on the field when you actually have to get out there and do it in anger. Um, But I feel like he's found his feet now. I feel like he's playing really well with great confidence. Like I said, great attacking um, skill going forward today Um, and really brave as well. Like didn't shirk away from any tackles, any battles that he had. Um, you know, I really felt like he was on it. I guess the shame is now is that obviously Danny is perhaps two, three weeks away from coming back into training. And then, of course, he'll, he will understandably be out of the team once Danny is fit. Um, but I personally, I think we're seeing more of what the real Ben Davis is this last couple of games than, you know, the, the poor performances that he first had when he came back into the side. If there was an opportunity in the summer to upgrade on that position, the left back one, would you be keen on doing that? Or do you think Davis is an adequate enough replacement for... Rose being out of the team? I mean, personally, if I look at kind of what's around, and I mean, you know, and we can talk about the transfer policy probably a little bit later. Yep. Um, the issue that you've got is that our first 11 is absolutely exceptional. And when you're going out to strengthen the squad, you are not going out to buy players who are going to start because you've got the starting 11. They are brilliant. Um, and so it's trying to find that balance between finding somebody who is really good cover but somebody who is going to be able to to deal with sitting on the bench and to deal with not getting much opportunity in the first team, particularly in the league. Um, And for me, uh, I look at Ben Davis and I don't see too many players out there in that position that I think they could come in and be much better than him for the role that he's having to play. If you're bearing in mind that he is not the first choice. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest, that I would... Certainly not based on the last kind of three games. I'm not. I don't think there would necessarily be an upgrade for the role that he has to play within the squad. Obviously, Danny Rose is streets ahead, um, but he's streets ahead of any left back in the Premier League, possibly even majority of left backs in Europe. So you know, I think that's a kind of different argument to be had. As is, as in, you know, could he ever match up to the, le- the level of Danny Rose? But in terms of the job he has to do in the squad, in the terms of being the backup, and in terms of having the right mentality for that. I don't actually see too many other left-backs out there that could fulfil that role. No, it's a fair point, and like I say it's a difficult conundrum maybe to look at in the summer. Let's bring you in, Jace. I want to ask you about a player, Jan Bertongen, completed more take-ons than any other player in today's game. 
what did you make of his performance? Because you always feel that he's in the shadow of Toby Alderweireld, but rightly so. I think today he kind of stood apart. I thought he was phenomenal at the back. Yes, obviously Lukaku got his goal in the end today, but the way he controlled him in the first half, I mean, he's still a quality centre-back, isn't he? Well, there was that little bit in the first half, wasn't he, when Lukaku got into her box, yeah, and just kept him at arm's length and just took the ball straight off the end of his foot as clean as anything came out with it. And that summed up Jan's performance today. The run early in that second half, which finished with a shot that we well, must have gone, what, 70 yards with the ball, was terrific to see, wasn't it? It was like the Jan Vertonghen of the very first season we had him. Um, and you think, I, I, I'm just stunned that he hasn't scored a goal for us. What is it, three and a half years since since the away goal at Swansea? Which uh, he's, he's desperate for a goal which as well. Which is bizarre. He was, uh, he was saying in his post-match that he's absolutely desperate to score again. He's been getting a bit of stick about it. Yeah, I mean, he smashed the bar last week, didn't he? I think, that, if I remember rightly, he, he did score, didn't he, a couple of seasons ago when he scored from our own half and they gave it offside or something yeah. stupid like that. But, <laughs> but um, no, it was, he was uh, a class apart today. Uh, looked even better than Toby for for most of the game, and it was just a shame that he, you know, probably slipped down from a nine out of ten to a eight and a half out of ten with the, the little slip for Lukaku. But no, it's great to have him back, and you realise when you see him back like that just how difficult it was for us, not just without Danny Rose, but with without him as well for that little period. I can have a go and come to Ian Victor Wanyama. Now, a lot of talk was made the season before about Morgan Schneidlin, and should we go in for him? Do you think it was decision vindicated today, based on Wanyama's performance? In a word, yes. I just think that um, Wanyama has been, you know, I think we've all said it, you know, the signing of the season for us. What is it, £11 million pounds is a snip. And, um, and, I, and I rated Schneidlin when he was at Southampton, and I was bitterly disappointed that we never got him. However, you know, when Yama has been superb, and, I, and again, I thought today he, he did all of that sort of like combative stuff and that horrible stuff that often doesn't get any plaudits but wins you football matches. And, and I just thought, again, both him and Dembele were, were, were just immense in our midfield. Great acquisition at the start of the season was, was, was when Yama. He really was. And I want to ask you a question, James. What do you make of the management that Maurizio Pochettino is doing with Harry Winks? He just seems to be at the moment, he's not throwing him into every game. He's easing him in. And for me, it looks like he's kind of making this player in a mould of Muta Dembele. What, what do you make of it, Firstly, So far, I think it's, it's absolutely perfect because a, a player of Harry Winks' age and where he are, is as a, as a Premier League footballer, he, if you came to him at the start of the season and said, you're going to get 500 minutes in half a season he, he'd, he'd snap your hand off you know but and he's he's appeared in I think the last 20 odd games or, or something like that but I think he'd absolutely snap your hand off if you told him that and he you know he's not the kind of bloke it seems to me who who is going to be he's going to be upset that he's not in our first team you know every every footballer wants to be starting games but I think he he needs to take a step back and think look this is where I am as a footballer I, uh, he's, a, he's a youngster coming through. He can't he can't expect to be starting games, but the way he's playing at the minute, he really is knocking on the door. But every time he's come on, he's, he's had an impact. He's had a solid impact. He's been one of our best passers of the ball. He really is looking. He's turning into one of one of the most mature members of our squad, even though he is so young. Dembele hasn't hasn't been you know the last few weeks hasn't been the the player that we that we saw at the start of the season today he was back to near on his best and so there obviously you're going to get the calls for Harry Winks to be called into the first team because that's who we are as a fan base you know something something goes slightly wrong we immediately call for someone else to be brought in but Winks has has done everything right this season every time Pochettino has given him a chance he's he's come good on it and i think he needs to be looking towards the future now you know that 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 central midfield spot is his in the future if he can keep on going how he's going and he can't, you know, he, he can't have any qualms for not starting games when Dembele and Wanyama are in such good form ahead of him. Well, he's also in a great position because Dembele, um, who obviously is phenomenal and we love, but he needs managing in terms of his fitness. We know that he doesn't necessarily have the strongest body in the way that some of the other players do, which is why he's off quite often the first one to be substituted, um, you know, after kind of you know, 65, 70 minutes. Um, and that automatically gives Winks a lot of uh, opportunity that he might not have. I mean, I personally, what I love about Harry uh, of the Winks variety um, is he, a bit like Harry of the Kane variety, he's got great footballing intelligence. His awareness of the game for somebody so young is really, really top-notch. I mean, the, the free kick for, for Delhi's goal today, I mean, it, he spotted that miles ahead of, of, of everybody else. You know, that's why Delhi was there to, to have the opportunity to score is because he caught everybody completely off guard and him and Delhi looked at each other and like, we can make this work. And 
Um, I've been so impressed with him every time he's come on this season. Um, I really think as well he can benefit from learning a lot from Dembele um, and from the kind of role that Dembele plays. And, you know, I'm really excited for him. And I'm especially whenever you hear him talk, you know, he is a, a proper lifelong Tottenham fan, local lad. He's living the dream every time he gets on that pitch. And I think he's got a special relationship with Pochettino as well, which is only going to benefit us, I think, in, in the years to come. He's a cracking player. And sticking with you, Emma, I want to ask your opinion on Deli Ali. Now, many people a couple of weeks ago, just after the Genk game, said no, he should be dropped. We sh- he needs to learn his lesson. He's come back. He's scored two goals in his last two games now. Like I say, 10 goals in his last 11 Premier League appearances. What's your take on the whole Deli Alley situation? Would you have wanted to see him dropped after that Genk game? Or are you, are you of the opinion that, no, the guy, he'll learn his lesson by being on the pitch. What do you make of it? Um, don't get me wrong, I was furious with Deli um, after the Genk game. Um, I thought he was a complete idiot, and I do think his sending off cost us that match. Um, having said that, I did not want, him, want to see him dropped. Um, I do feel that the best way for him to learn is to keep playing and to keep learning to get this nasty side of his, of his temper under control. I think there's always, you kind of mentioned it earlier, there's always a rush that, you know, if a player does something wrong immediately, like we should go out and we should change it rather than giving them the opportunity to correct it themselves. And um, I like the fact that Pochettino has really looked after Delhi and has, has, you know, taken him under his wing and defended him perhaps when other people would have maybe hung him out to dry a little bit. Um, the thing is about Delhi is, you know, when he's good and when he's on form, his football does the talking. He is such a special talent. Um, you know, the, the touch for that goal today was just sensational. And, and the funny thing is, a bit like um, Harry Kane, he can he can turn a game like with just one moment. Um, you know, we were actually on, on the verge of saying that Delhi had had a quiet game today, and then he popped up and, and scored that. You know, scored a fantastic goal. Um, and that's what's so exciting about him is that you just don't know when he's going to do something brilliant, but you know that something brilliant is going to come. I mean, he is still so young. And again, it's really easy, I think, for people to forget that. He's 20 years of age. You know, he is only in his second season playing at a Premier League club with European football and all the pressures that come with that. He will learn. And I think Pochettino trusts him to learn. Um, That doesn't excuse his petulant behaviour and his temper, which he has got to get under control. Um, But, you know, one step at a time, like, cut the lads some slack like I said I was furious with him after Ghent but at no point did I think he shouldn't start the next game No, I completely spot on I completely agree with you and bringing it to you Jace I know you had your son the Deli debate so let's come on to something else um, where do you stand now obviously Chelsea are to play tomorrow evening we're recording on the Sunday night so we don't know what their result is going to be but in terms of the league position at the moment we've cut it down to seven points we're four points clear of Liverpool six points clear of fifth placed Arsenal how are you looking at things now in terms of that race for the top four or dare we say even the title race has anything changed in your mind at all I'll tell you to get back in your cupboard Rick and stop thinking about it listen I've got to ask I've got to ask the question <laughs> Jason. I've got to ask the question <laughs> Let's wait for those last four games when we've got Man United and Arsenal and West Ham and all of that. And Because, let's be fair, it will take us until that stage to realistically, if we have a chance of catching them, you're not going to make it up in one or two weeks, are you? So, no. you know, for me, I'm still looking over our shoulders and thinking, let's, let's put ourselves in as much distance between us and ideally fourth place. Let, let's get a top three place secure. And then at the stage when we're secured of that top three place, let's then have a look at above us and see where Chelsea are. I mean, you know, to secure that top three place, you've got to win every game every week anyway. So by doing that, we, all we can do is, is try and stay within, with, within range of Chelsea. But one thing I do want to say on the, the Everton game, because he's a player that's um, taken a lot of flack this season, and uh, rightly so, but we just had a tiny, tiny little contribution, a little acorn, shall we say, today from Vincent Jensen, who, when he came on with, what, three or four minutes left, he just brought that little bit of energy, and he, it was him that won the free kick through a through a challenge with um, I think it was Ashley Williams that we scored the third goal from. So, you know, it wasn't his biggest contribution. It's not the contribution we want to see him making, but at least in his little few minutes today, he came on and made a contribution, and it, it ended up being a, a valuable contribution to those three points. So, you know, he's had the order flack and lots of people on his back, but just just uh, just right to give him a mention today and a bit of praise. No, I agree. I, I mean, I don't know to be honest. This guy's got a future at the club. I know we've spoken about it at length. Um, Ian, we're going to come to you. Five clubs battling for three places. How do you view it? Well, our, our current league form actually says that we do because, you know, we are currently sitting prettily in second and, you know, we're, we're playing some good football. 
and you know, and our run in apart from the United and the Arsenal games as Jason mentioned earlier, our run in is on paper as easy as, as as any of the other teams in that race. So it's like I think I said last week. I want us to finish second if we can't finish first, because you know my views about mathematics and uh you know, and I, and I also want us to win, win, win the FA Cup. So, if, if that's me being naive, then I'm sorry to to those people who think that. But you know, I'm 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 a an optimist by by nature, and I will stick by that until such time as those two ideals are, are, are proved to be wrong. Fair enough, and you're and you're more than right to do that. Uh, James, coming to finish it off in terms of the, the summary of the uh, league at the moment. What's your take on it? Very much the same, really. I think um, that 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 top four. Is is obviously our, our, our biggest biggest target this season. I, I absolutely love the fact that we're even talking about being title contenders or, or t- uh, challenging for the Premier League. Judging by where we've come in the last few years, it really is testament to Pochettino, his backroom staff, and the players that have brought in. In even my lifespan of watching Spurs, which is nowhere near as long as you guys. No offense, I don't mean to call you old guys. I'm just <laughs> saying, I, in my my experience, you know, I've I've gone from watching Spurs. Mid table to Spurs, Europa League to Spurs, Champions League to Spurs, back to Europa League. Now we're talking about Spurs challenging for the title. I I have to agree with you, Rick, in that I think Chelsea are gonna are gonna run away with it. They're gonna they're gonna maintain this gap. I can't see them slipping up too much. But really, what we should be doing is is concentrating our on our own football. Or if we go out and we get three points every week, then nothing changes. You know, we've done our we've done our level best. And we can say that at the end of the season. It, say, I mean, last season, if we if we do what we did last season and have a chance at winning the title and 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 bottle it, so to speak, then that is our fault. But if we go out, play our best every week, and and take take the three points every week, it's not our fault if Chelsea go and win the league. I yeah. would also love to to see us go and finish ahead of Arsenal. I know it's a bit of an obsession that that um, <laughs> that, that we keep on going on about, um, but it really would be nice just to. Just to shut them up for once, you know they're having they're having a really horrible time. We're having a really great time, and for them to still finish above us, if if in in this situation, it'd be really heartbreaking. What it is with the Arsenal thing as well is like it's not. I mean, I do want to shut them up, but you know, it's also because it's like I think we deserve it. I look at our first eleven, and I look at their first eleven. I look at the way that we play, and I look at the way that they played this season, and I just think we're better than them. Like. It would be so frustrating. I completely agree with you, but what I would say is that now, being honest with ourselves, I think 10 years ago to finish above Arsenal would be seen as a great achievement if you look back at the Invincibles or whatever. Would it be seen as such a great achievement now to finish above them? Bearing in mind, you look at the disarray they're in. We're six points clear of them. You've got such a diversity there in terms of whether they want the manager in or the manager out. Is our biggest problem as a football club sometimes, Emma, just to ask you this question, do we maybe sometimes look at the smaller picture rather than look at the bigger picture? For me, it should be looking at the bigger and better things. We should be looking to go for this league now and not worry about Arsenal. Whereas I think last season again towards the end, yes, we did run out of steam. But the obsession of the Arsenal thing, although I do want to finish above them, I don't get it now because of how much in disarray they are. Well, I think when something hasn't happened for 22 years, um, it's always going to be a big deal when it happens. And so for that more than anything, I think it is still a big deal to finish above them, regardless of how much disarray that they're in at the moment and how many problems they're having you know, on and off the pitch. But I do take your point in as much as it shouldn't be the be-all and end-all. Um, you know, for me, last season... You know, the end of last season was just a horror show, a complete mm. capi- a capitulation that should never have happened. Um, and in that case, I kind of wanted the players to want it more. You know, I wanted them to finish above Arsenal and to understand how much we wanted it. This season, it's like you said, it is about finishing as high as you possibly can in the league. I mean, I have to say, I admire your optimism, but I can't see Chelsea slipping up. It's not no, that I don't yeah. think we'll put mm. pressure on them. But, you know, they have been phenomenal this season. You know, it pains me to say it. But Antonio Conte has got them playing wonderfully. And, you know, they Costa, Hazard, etc., you know, completely rejuvenated. Um, it would take a miracle for us, us to win the league. Not because we won't keep winning, but because they're not going to slip up. Um, but having said that, like second place would be a massive achievement for us. You know, it'd be a huge achievement. And what I would also like to see is us not finish 10 points behind the leaders like we did last season. Um, because, again, we're better than that. You know, we've beaten Chelsea this season. Um, so, you know, there have been moments where we've been better than them. Um, if we get to the end of this season and we finish 10 points behind them, I'll be really disappointed. I would expect the gap to be more like four or five or maybe six, because like I said, I can't see them slipping up that much. 
but I want us to be closer. I want us to be pushing them right to the very end. I want them to be looking over their shoulder, you know, even though we know they're going to get over the line, I want them to still be worrying about us behind them. I really do. No, I completely agree with you. And I, to be fair, I mean, in all honesty, I don't think the league this season is a doable task. I do think Chelsea have got it won. But like we've just said here, all about kind of pushing up and trying to get that second place sealed and showing the rest of the league that, look, we are a threat. We're not going to go anywhere. We are building season upon season. So, yeah. Of course, if we finish second, then we will finish above Arsenal anyway. So, well, there you, you go, know, Matt. Job, <laughs> job, job, job's the good Perfect. <laughs> Great. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> job done anyway. Guys, we're going to go for a quick break. And then after that, we're going to take your questions for tonight's panel. Hi guys, welcome back to the East First Podcast. As always, we ask you to get our questions into us on a weekly basis and you can do that by going to our Twitter, which is at E underscore Spurs, leaving your question and ending your tweet in hashtag E Spurs Pod. As always, you've got into us in your droves this week. However, we're going to select a few to our tonight's panel, and we're going to start with you tonight, James. I think it's fairly kind of <laughs> common on the moment at the moment on social media, the Eric Lamella gate at the moment as to what is happening. So we've got a question here from Stephanus Spiru who says, I'm definitely not a conspiracist, but do you genuinely believe that Lamella is injured? I think no one can say for sure what, what actually is going on with Eric Lamella. You know, he, what we can say for sure is that he's a top, top player who was in absolutely unbelievable form at the start of the season. He was a, an absolute mainstay in our starting eleven before we switched to to the new uh, three at the back formation, and he was playing the best football than we that we've seen him play at Spurs at the start of the season. He and he really was making the team tick. We saw initially before we moved to four three uh, to three four three. Sorry, that without Lamella in the side, we looked like a completely different team. We looked maybe a bit flat and a, look, a little bit void of ideas. Um, the, the change of formation kind of counteracted that by allowing our full-backs to kind of, kind of take over. But the situation with Lamella, I, I will freely admit, it is a, it's a very weird one. You know, we had the rumours of him going back to Argentina for personal issues. Um, there was the, the whole rumour about his dog. Um, then we heard about him go, being in Rome for, for surgery. But whatever it is, whatever's going on, I think there's people who are in the the very much for Eric Lamella camp, and then there are some people who are no matter what he does, they're going to be in in the Lamella out camp. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a supportive fan. I'll support every player in that squad. I don't, you know, it's Musa Sissoko is another one. I'm not the biggest fan of him, but he puts that Spurs shirt on every week, and that means I'm going to support the guy. If Eric Lamella has a knee injury, has an ankle injury, then we'll support him through it. If he has mental issues, if he has a problem, then we'll support him through that too because we're meant to be a supportive fan base. We're meant to be looking after players who are our own. You know, we call Harry Kane one of our own. We call Eric Lamella one of our own. They all wear the Spurs shirt and we should be looking after them. Especially a player who, who has contributed as much as Lamella has You know, at the start of the season, as I say unbelievable form and even if he doesn't get back straight back into this start at 11 he's definitely a valuable asset to have coming off that off that bench and so whether you're for Lamella or against him we need to be behind the guy echo those thoughts 100% and like I say this guy I mean you definitely do see a difference when he's in the team so fingers crossed like I say there'll definitely be a route back into this team for Eric Lamella let's move it along let's come to you tonight Ian um I've got a question here asking even with injuries, the back three formation really works well for us. Why would Pochettino want to deviate away from that? I think we've touched on this before, Rick, and that's the fact that sometimes that formation doesn't work as well as it should do. And, in, and I've always said in football, you need different systems for different situations. If you've got a, a, an opposition coming up, which you think are going to cause you particular problems, then maybe, you know, going forward at the back is the option that you have to do. And, and, and if you need to do that, you need the personnel to actually enable that to happen. So that's how I would answer that. That's a great question. Um, we're going to come round. I will get the person who answers that question, just so we've got that on the podcast. But I'm going to move it along now and bring you in, Jace. We've got a question here from Jason Aaron at Fraggle29, who asks, do we go for the likes of a Tillman's a Mbappé, young European talent in the summer, or a Barkley, Zahar, Gray, etc. Premier League proven. What do you think? Oh, it's, it's really hard, isn't it? I think, as I've said before, I think if you're going to go for the, the elite players and you're in competition with, with Manchester City, with PSG, with 
Real Madrid's, with Man United, with Chelsea. You know, those those players, you're going to have to pay them massive wages. And I just don't think we'll sign elite players. I think we can waste all summer going for elite players if we want to, but they're just not. They'll they'll always will always be the last resort for an elite player for me. So I think you you have to look at, at perhaps that level just underneath that. Um, Tielemans is obviously slightly different because he's he's attracted lots of attention in the past over the past two or three years from uh, from Anderlecht, and maybe he's not the type of player that those elite clubs will go for. So so we would, but it's a big step from the Belgium league. But that that shouldn't put you off doing it. I think with anything, I think it will be a case of Daniel Levy will give Pochettino 60 million quid at the most. It will be, you know, what else can you raise in terms of transfers? And therefore, you're left with how you spend that. And the, the bigger the player you go for and the more that person costs you, then you have to accept that further down trying to build the squad, you've got less money left to, to replace elsewhere. So, you know, I, I, I like Barkley. I must admit, I think Pochettino could get a tune out of Barkley. And I think of, of all the names linked to us, he looks inconsistent, Barkley. I'm not always sure he makes the right decisions. But I think of certainly of the three English names that were mentioned, as in terms of Gray, Zaha and Barkley, I'd sooner us go for Barkley. But, um, you know, the one I'd like to see us go for is, and I've said it in the past, I'd like to see us go for Ian Acho who I think will be available from Manchester City as well and, and he's got that little bit of uh, Jermaine Defoe in him as well Just on your question there Ian Yacho, only because I need to ask you this really is that if Spurs do go on to finish second that's the second season in a row that you would arguably say look Spurs we're now, I wouldn't say consistently but we're up there now in terms of finishing around the Champions League places on a regular basis would Man City sell to Spurs in terms of a direct rival would you, would you believe that if we offered enough money? I don't think I don't think Guardiola minds who he sells to I think Guardiola would sooner say look this players not for me and, and he'd sooner get off I don't think he's he's quite as narrow minded as that and I think Guardiola's a type of person that will think whoever we bring in will be better than Ian Acho so I, I don't have a problem with selling him to Spurs uh, I think he'll sell Joe Hart to Liverpool if, if Liverpool's the most likely destination for Joe Hart to go to I don't think he'll fear anything like that and, and you shouldn't do I mean at the end of the day if you think the player's not good enough for your club it shouldn't really matter where you sell him to. I watched um, Barkley today with, with the sort of a, an eye on a possible conversation point during this pod. And I, I agree with Jason. I think Pochettino could get a, a good tune out of him. I thought he had a great game today. He was combative. He sprayed the ball around. And I, I just think that of all of the people that we've been linked to, I wouldn't be disappointed with, with Ross Barkley coming to Tottenham because I think he would... He would definitely improve under Pochettino. And I think that, as we've discussed in previous pods, I do actually believe that he would strengthen our squad. So, um, you know, it was, it was an interesting little um, watch from me on, on Ross Barkley today. I thought we had a great game. Possible alternative in for Ericsson, in your opinion? Def, with, with Ericsson, what, what frustrates me sometimes is we, we talk about it in, in the crowd, you know, around us in the, in the Paxton. And you, sometimes he just sort of like bottles out of things. And you think to yourself, somebody like Barkley would not get bullied off the ball as Ericsson does sometimes. But, um, yeah, I, I'd say that he, he would provide... Ericsson some competition that perhaps he hasn't got at the moment and we're going to finish the questions off tonight with coming to you Emma um, we've got a question here from Cameron Yarde Jr who asks is Spurs transfer policy holding back how far they move on is it time to be more ambitious now before you answer it can't forget obviously we've had the likes of the signings this summer obviously Wanyama we, I think we're all going to agree you know across the board that he's been a great signing but then you look at Vincent Janssen Musa Sissoko now I don't know how many, how many minutes these guys have had this season but for the investment put in these guys it is slightly concerning isn't it what's your opinion in terms of the transfer policy well um, I, I don't necessarily agree with that I think possibly the only one you could really raise that concern over is Sissoko uh, he's our record signing he hasn't made the impact that obviously Pochettino was hoping that he would make but there was I think an element of panic buy about him at the very end of the window um, and I think that's shown in the fact that actually he doesn't necessarily fit into the team the way that Pochettino wants his team to play um, I really feel for Vincent Janssen at the moment and I really hope that he gets another season at Tottenham um, you know in my mind I keep thinking about this time last year when people had completely written Sonny off and said that he was useless, that he should be sold. There were talks about him going back to Germany and people were like, you know, he's no good. He's totally ineffective. You fast forward 12 months and he's become one of the most vital squad players that we've got. 
not only for what he offers on the pitch, but for the goals that he scores as well. Um, you know, there's always a threat when he comes on the on the field as a substitute. I wouldn't necessarily say he has the same impact um, uh, if he starts, um, but certainly coming on from the bench, he's you know he's got some really important goals for us. And you think you know it took him a year to get used to how things are here because it is very different. The Premier League is so different to any of the other European leagues, and I don't think sometimes people have enough patience with the fact that it takes time to adjust. Obviously, some players come in, they hit the ground running and they're just able to do it. It happens that way. But you have to notice, not just at Spurs, but actually across Premier League clubs as a whole, players who do come in from other European leagues quite often do not hit their stride in that first season that they're here because it is such a different league and it's such a different style of play. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more patience, I think, when it comes to writing off our players who haven't performed out of their skins in their daily seasons. That's me personally. Um, it touches a little bit on something that I said earlier on. You know, it's a very difficult balancing act that, that Pochettino faces now in terms of, of, of bringing players in. Um, a, obviously, we don't have the same level of funds that the likes of Chelsea and Manchester City do. And we are also going to be constrained, whether we like it or not, by the fact that we have got this new stadium to pay for. Um, maybe not directly in the fact that, you know, the actual physical transfer funds might be ring fenced away for it. But things like wages, you know, add-on clauses and all those kind of things will be affected by the fact that we need to, to pay for this stadium. Um, but secondly, I don't feel like Pochettino is the kind of manager who is a big name signing kind of guy. If you look at, you know, we talked about him already, our most successful player and the guy that, that Pochettino wanted number one over anybody else in the summer was Victor Wanyama. £11 million is nothing in this. And he's not what you would call a glamour player. He's not a high profile signing. He didn't come from a glamorous club. And yet he's proved to be absolutely vital because he fitted into the team exactly where Pochettino wanted him and played exactly how Pochettino wants him to play. Um, I think there's a real danger that, you know, when people go and say we want to buy this player for £30 million, £40 million, like we want to make a big impact. It's like, well... It's all very well spending that money, but what's the point if they don't fit into how you play or if they don't fit into the team ethos or if they don't fit into that high-pressing style that Pochettino demands? Um, I think as well, you know, we have to be a little bit careful. We've obviously got a squad that are incredibly strong in terms of team unity and in their bond with the manager as well. And you have to be careful that you don't want to rock the boat. Um, you know, you don't want to disrupt that when you've got such a good team ethos because bottom line is it is a team game. There are 11 guys on that pitch. There are 22 guys in the squad. Uh, or 25 guys in the squad and you know you all have to be working for each other and if you've got one player I mean, we, we saw it happen with Adebayor you know you've got one player who doesn't necessarily fit into that mindset it can be really disruptive to the dressing room which can be more damaging itself than any any numbers of signings that you might miss out on if you don't have your team ethic in the dressing room and that's a, a far bigger worry in my opinion I just think people need to be a little bit careful what they wish for um, because I, I said earlier on, and I stand by it, that our first 11, when they're all fit and they're all firing, there are very few players that I'd want to replace and substitute in for our first 11, because I think they really are, you know, if you look at our back four or back three in particular, if you look at our striker, if you look at our defensive midfielders, I mean, there are very few, our goalkeeper, you, you look at it and you go, well, who would I have instead? Like, realistically, seriously, who would I actually want instead of these guys? And I said, when you add to that the fact that, if you're then looking for squad players, and I do think we need to build some strength and depth in the summer, um, you're looking for guys that are going to be able to do a job when they're not always the first name on the team sheet and when they're not playing every game. And that's a difficult type of player to find. Um, I trust Pochettino to do it, um, but I don't think that necessarily means you're going to see massive money signings. And I don't think that's necessarily the way that we as a club should be going. I mean, it looks like we're doing pretty well so far. I mean... Pochettino's transfer policy hasn't been to sign the massive names and yet look we've had a third place in the league we're currently second in the league you know we're pushing for the title two seasons in a row which you know for somebody like me who grew up in the uh, late 80s early 90s when you know we were on relegation form this is like absolute dreamland so I, I just think you know Pochettino's got a plan he's built he's got a project and he knows what he's doing and I think we need to give him a little bit more credit and trust him a little bit more. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very, very fine balancing act, isn't it? And I think, and if anyone saw the documentary this week, uh, the NBC documentary, which heavily featured Maurizio Pochettino, um, Daniel Levy, a lot of the kind of Spurs scouting staff, the first question Pochettino asks in terms of when he's looking at a player isn't about the quality, it's about what's he like as a person, what's he yeah. like as a character. That, yeah. I think, first and foremost, seems to be what he wants to address. Are these players going to fit 
into my squad in terms of the unity, can they be the same? And, and a lot of people laugh about the handshakes and whatever, but I mean, that is just part of the game, isn't it? It obviously seems for him that he wants to bring this family feel to it, and I'm sure as a fan now, you can feel that connection that you have felt in years at Spurs. Massively. You know, like you said, Emma, we've been around since like the Sherwood, the AVB days, God, Christian Gross back to then. <laughs> I don't think there's has ever been a more connected kind of spirit between the fans and, like I say, the players. And I think that's why you're seeing the performances you are at White Hart Lane because it is such a spiritual home. Yeah. And let's hope, like I say, we can manage it next season when um, it looks like we're going to be at Wembley. But um, let's let's come on to Wembley because um, maybe oh God, too that's far. a whole other debate. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to speak about. Millwall, the Millwall game which may lead us there again um, let's start with you James Millwall they're sixth in League One going into this one well, we laughed about it a couple of weeks ago saying that they're probably going to bring the stadium development forward after they visited um, <laughs> what do you make of that fixture no I think it's, it's a mix that we, that we need to it's, uh, need to get right it's a delicate balance you know we need to respect these sides we, we maybe didn't give Wickham the, the, the respect that uh, that that we should have and that's why we struggled against them you know and then we saw in the next round against Fulham when we when we did give them the, that respect that the, the, it all turned out fine you know we, we absolutely comfortably walked over them I, I said it uh, on, on the eFootball podcast with Dan Tracy we, we discussed how when you put out like a second team side a, a reserve side you, you really are making it harder for yourself you know these then when you put up, put out a, a full strength side like we did against Fulham, it's almost like a training session. You know that game against Fulham really was a massive training session for that first for that first eleven. And we saw with Harry bagging his hat trick, and and it's kind of kick started this kind of form that we've seen now. And so going into the Millwall game, if we do decide to to drop a number of players again and and bring in our, our second rate players, you'd like to think that they they would be able to step up, but really it just isn't the case. The 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 gap between our first team and our second team is still too big if, if you ask me and that's that's down to what Emma said about getting these players in the transfer window when we already have our starting eleven absolutely nailed on you know we've, we've got these players who don't necessarily want to be set, sitting on the bench um, but then but then again what players do want to sit on the bench you know it's very difficult to sign big names when there's already a big name in your starting eleven who they they kind of know they're not going to get ahead of back to Millwall you know I personally would like to see us go with a full strength squad. It just depends on how Pochettino is seeing the league at the minute. If if he's taking our point of view, well, my point of view, which is we're probably not going to win the league this year, and we are probably we are going to be able to hold this top four spot. You know, it. You'd like to think so. Um, and so, and I know a trophy really is high on the agenda for a lot of Spurs fans. You know, a lot of the traditional Spurs lads that. You know the game is about glory at the end of the day, and so I really would like to see us take this Millwall game seriously, treat them with a bit of respect, and put them out of the competition. But it's a big, big game for our season. I will say it because, like I say, we've spoken about the need for a trophy. Coming on to you, Jace. I know obviously last week you were adamant. You know the ultimate trophy is the most important thing. I completely agree with you on that. This game, though, what kind of selection do you want to see Spurs go with? Are you happy with a mixture, or do you want to see the best eleven out there? For me now, you know, there's no Europa League game this week or the following week, so we haven't got the distractions of that. So you've got a nice week off to prepare for it, and you've got a week after it clear. So I'd, I'd go with exactly the same side that, that played today and, and started last week and try and get the job done. And, you know, if you get yourself into a position, then you can take one or two of them off. I think that the other thing I would say is that we underestimated two sides this year in Wickham and Ghent overall we underestimated Wickham who came to White Hart Lane in really good form and uh, put up one hell of a fight and uh, full credit to them for that and then we underestimated Ghent and the appeal that Wembley and, and such in their 100th European tie would bring and there's no doubt Millwall will see this as a massive tie last ever cup tie at White Hart Lane chance for them to to put their their name in the history books of White Hart Lane isn't it for them and there'll be a a big motivation whatever we think of their their crowd they'll they'll come in their numbers they'll they'll make a hell of a lot of noise and they'll make life really hard for us and and the other thing i would say about Millwall if we are a little bit complacent they um i'm not sure what their their result was saturday but they they conceded their first goal in nine games they kept eight successive clean sheets going into saturday so that tells you how solid they are and okay that's within their own league but you shouldn't disrespect a side that can obviously defend as well as that. And they've got Jordan Archer, I think, in goal, who was a young young Spurs apprentice, wasn't he? And, and youth team player. And he'll be 
determined to, to put on a show at White Hart Lane. So, you know, if, if we underestimate them by 5%, we'll give ourselves a problem. If we, we get our proper heads on and approach the game like we have done today's game, then we should be OK. It is going to be a very, very big fixture. And finally, coming to you, Ian, what's your thoughts in terms of selection for that game? Well, I agree with everything that uh, has been said so far is that um, we can't afford to take it lightly. Any team that has made it to the quarterfinals of, of the FA Cup has to be taken seriously. And um, like we saw in the Fulham away game, that was a, a, a performance and, and, and a start in the lineup that took Fulham very seriously. And um, in the end, it was a very, very easy and accomplished performance from from what was, to all intents and purposes, most of our first 11. So, you know, I, I would like us to take that seriously because it means, you know, if, if we get through next weekend, we're, we're back at Wembley again for a semi-final and let's hope that we can get through it. And finally, Emma, I'm going to finish up with you. Um, in terms of what you're, we've spoken a lot about on this podcast, in terms of trophies, how important it is, just how imperative is it for you that Spurs get over the line in terms of this FA Cup? I think it's huge. Um, me personally, I equate it right up there with being as important, if not slightly more important than finishing in the top four this season. Um, my priority um, before we went out of it was to win the Europa League uh, because I, was, I felt that was silverware and uh, Champions League plays all in one. Um, but for me, I think this side needs to start winning silverware. They need to get this monkey off their back that they're underachieving um, because I think, you know, we've seen, they obviously got to the League Cup final in the first season under Pochettino, you know, were outplayed by Chelsea, looked a bit overawed by the big occasion. Obviously, we saw what happened last season with the, you know, the debacle of the last month um, of the season and finishing third when we should have finished second. Um, you know, we've looked at the fact that, you know, we went out to a substandard side in the Europa League that we should have beaten. Um, I think really now this team needs something to, to erase all those memories, to show what they've learned from all those defeats and all those setbacks. I think Pochettino is taking the cup really seriously now. Um, I think the Fulham lineup proved that, and I would expect him to go with a full strength lineup um, on Sunday. Uh, like uh, the other guys have pointed out, you know, we haven't got another game for a week. This is a, a complete break for us, so there's no reason not to go full strength. Um, and I think it would be such a shame if the t this team, as it currently is in this current form, doesn't win any silverware. They deserve a trophy, and I think mentally for them, it would really help them kick on to the next level. Um, so for me I think the FA Cup's absolute top priority this season I really really do yeah and I, I actually am in agreement with you Emma I think across the ball we were all sad how important it is to get that first, first trophy fingers crossed we can do it let's go round the table and let's get some predictions then uh, we'll sit with you Emma what are you going for? Uh, against Millwall 3-0 uh, 3-0 ok and James what do you think? Uh, I'm going to go confident and say 3-1 3-1 ok nice and Jace? I'll go 2-0 2-0 nil. Nil. and Ian? 2-1 2-1. OK, a full house, a clean sweep, and I'm also going to go... I'm going to go 4-0. I think we will turn up and get the job done. It's a brave prediction to make. It will mean us going back to Wembley, which I'm sure will be an interesting experience for anyone, what we've had this season. Um, guys, I can't thank you enough for tonight. Emma, thanks so much for coming on to the show. No, thanks for having me. It's been great. I've absolutely loved it. Lovely, and we'll hope to get you on again towards the end of the season, fingers crossed. Um, Jay, thank you as always. No problem, mate. Just a quick reminder on Millwall. Don't forget anyone, no replay from this round. And we have a fourth substitute in extra time, I'm told. So it's well, a totally different format to, to normal FA Cup. There you go. Mr. James. Hopefully we won't need to explore any of those options. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fingers crossed. As long as it's not Vincent Janssen, we'll be OK. <laughs> <laughs> we might get a penalty, mate. Don't, don't write him off yet. <laughs> he'll come on and score the winner now. You just know it's destined after that. Um, James, thank you as always. Always a pleasure. Thanks very much, Rick. My pleasure, not at all. And Ian, again, thank you for your time. You're welcome, and uh, it's been great to be part of uh, tonight's show. Yeah, it's been an absolute cracking show. I'm sure you guys will enjoy it. Well, guys, as always, thank you so much for tonight. Um, we'll be back after the Millwall game, reviewing hopefully Spurs on their way to Wembley again. As always, have a great evening, guys, and a great weekend. And come on, you Spurs! Come on, you Spurs!